Okay, so it's now live. If you have anybody come into it, like the um, waiting room for this. Yeah. Okay, attendees. Okay, so these people are all logged in. Perfect. Okay. I don't really need to see that, but I'll just look. You can pull up the Q and A. Okay, so you should be good. And I'm going to go. Thanks for being here. What a woke up this morning, pouring rain, start of a new program year, unlike any program year I would have ever dreamt of, change in schedules, and lo, here you all are. So you are to be commended for that. I, I appreciate it. I want to begin um, with prayer. And because this will be a, a Bible study, a survey course, we're going to look from Genesis to Revelation within the first 10 minutes of the course, um, looking at how the thread of mission, God's, uh, God's intention to bring all of creation um, back into unity and harmony and all people back into relationship with him, how that is a thread woven through the entirety of the biblical narrative. Uh, and I believe that can be a very helpful key for you as you try to make sense of um, various passages and so forth. All right. Everything okay over there? <laughs> All right. Oh, is that what that is? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to draw attention to that. I thought, is it just really raining hard all of a sudden? <laughs> For those of you watching online, we have a, uh, a really nice coffee machine here. And it, it's, it's grinding coffee beans. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is one of the prayers for mission. 
in the Book of Common Prayer. In fact, it's located in the daily office. Uh, you'll be familiar with it, but I thought it'd be an appropriate start to our class. Let us pray. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So that's not only one of the classic prayers uh, for a mission in our prayer book, it's just such an appropriate prayer for today, um, given, given events. So I bet you most, if not all of you, have had some familiarity with the book that I'm about to mention. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Uh, this year uh, is the 30th anniversary of the original publication of that book, one of the best-selling nonfiction business books of all time, uh, written by Stephen Covey, uh, who was a businessman, a consultant, a speaker, and obviously an author. Uh, I understand it sold more than 25 million copies by now and has been translated into more than 40 languages. Uh, so I was actually listening to a, an interview with his son talking about that book earlier this summer, and they published a 30th anniversary edition. As we know from the gospel according to John, Jesus said, I came that they might be highly effective people. Of course, he did not say that. <laughs> Why am I starting with a secular book? Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, but, 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 um, what would it look like if we were more highly effective uh, in pursuing that, that goal, that aim? So this is just a quick question. Um, you can shout your answers to me. Does anybody here remember one or more of the seven habits of highly effective people? You, you strike me as highly effective people. <laughs> what? Okay, well, we're not gonna, this, this, we're not gonna do the whole list today, uh, but habit number one is be proactive, okay? Take responsibility, um, take responsibility for your growth as a Christian. Um, I think this is a really important time for the life of the church all over for us to be proactive uh, around a number of important ministries. Uh, be proactive discerning the times. What's going on? Um, how, how might God be calling me into different realms of ministry? Um, be proactive returning to uh, fundamentals of the faith. This has long been true that in unstable times, the people of God are called to return to first order things, to, to, to fundamentals, uh, to the Bible itself. So we'd be practical and proactive. Habit number one. Um, I'm really interested in the second habit. Somebody gave me this book, by the way, when it was published, and um, I, I, I wondered what they were thinking when they gave it to me. You know, here, Lee, you need to read this book. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I was not a highly effective person at all back in 1990, I guess. But um, I'll never forget when I read it, this was the habit that has stuck with me. I'll never forget it. Number two, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So that when you begin a task, when you begin a life as an adult or begin a career, uh, obviously events may overtake your plans. That's that goes without saying. Anybody mature understands that you can't predict precisely and chart your course exactly how it's going to go. But you want to have a vision, in other words. So you begin with the end in mind. In what direction am I headed? You know, what at the end, when I look back, what are the things that I'm going to want to say, whether it's a business project, a church ministry, or an entire life? What will be most important? And begin now to be thinking about that out there so that when you get there at the end, you can look back uh, and see how blessed and effective you've been in that. So when we begin with the end in mind, 
again, this is secular language. Now, I want to I fold that into Christian vocabulary. How do we define that for Christians? Beginning with the end in mind. What is the end? Being in the presence of God. Bingo. Somebody here undoubtedly grew up in one of the Reformed traditions, Presbyterian Church, for example. You might remember this from the Westminster Shorter Catechism talking about the end. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What's the point of life? That's the point of life. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So where do we, where do we see a vision of that? You know, beginning with the end in mind. So let's go to the end. And, and where, do we, where do we see a vision of what I've just described or quoted from the Westminster Shorter Catechism? We, as Christians, a people of a book, a holy book, holy scripture, we go to the end. <laughs> we go to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, we can go to the end of that. And there we have a vision. The end of mankind, of humanity, is to be with God and to be in unity with one another in the heavenly city. So we're going to begin this survey of the Bible looking at our place in the Bible story of God's mission at the end and then jump back to the beginning because this is where we're going from page one, okay? Uh, this is actually a, a, a painted wood altar panel. Uh, perhaps people at home can see this um, even better than you in the room. Um, from the 15th century, it was taken from a church in Tuscany, and it's on display at the National Gallery in London. Um, but I'll describe it very briefly. Uh, it's Jesus and lots and lots of people moving in his direction. And this is, a, this is an artistic portrayal of the passage from Revelation 21 that will probably be familiar to you. This is the vision that uh, St. John the Divine has of the end. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. So what I want to highlight, among many things we could talk about with this text, we're going to move through it fairly briskly, is twice the mention of the nations, and then also the mentions of, mention of the kings of the earth who will bring their glory. Who are we talking about here? The nations and the kings of the earth. We're talking about everybody. We're talking about Gentiles, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about all the peoples of the earth being brought into relationship forever to God in Christ and to one another. So the end, actually, you see here, is not a bigger church. The end is not, you know, this long, infinite worship service. <laughs> the end actually is people coming together, and the, the, the metaphor, the vision is of a city, of a civilization, of culture, uh, of life together. Everybody is included in it. The only thing that is excluded as you continue reading is things that are, that are unclean. So if you are looking at this, looking at that, that artistic rendering, and this doesn't make much sense when you read the nations are brought in and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. If you do, that, where, I don't know what that means. What you should do and what we're going to do is say, okay, well, let's back up and start over. <laughs> Where do we go? Well, you could back up from here to say the great commission of Jesus to his disciples. 
The last thing Jesus says to his disciples before he ascends into heaven is, you will be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1, before the ascension, before Pentecost, you will be my witnesses where? Just here in Jerusalem? Or just here in Jerusalem and Judea because, you know, this is where the Jewish race is. No, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to all the nations. If you're reading the Great Commission and you don't exactly understand where that comes from, well, let's back up to the beginning of the gospel. What is the first thing that Jesus says to his disciples? If that's the last thing. What's the first thing? Follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. It's there, it's there in the call that we are to be missionaries. And if that doesn't make sense, well, let's go back to the Hebrew scriptures and we could go to a lot of places. And we, in fact, will be going to different places in the Hebrew scriptures this fall. But one of the, the more well-known is the prophet Isaiah in chapter 42 says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. And I have given you as a covenant to the people to be a light to the nations. So Isaiah's vision is that the reason God calls Israel into covenant in the first place is for a cause greater than themselves, but that they will be incorporated into God's missional love for all nations, a light to all nations. And if you're reading that and you still, I don't know where that comes from, well, then let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And we can go to chapter 12 in the call of, of Abraham uh, that will lead Abraham and Sarah out of their homeland in Mesopotamia to journey with God into this, this promised land. And the call says the following line, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So all the way we're seeing this universal purpose of God in calling the one, the particular, a nation, to be the agency through which all peoples of the earth, all nations, all kings are united. Well, you might get to Genesis chapter 12 and see the call of Abraham and go, this is, seems kind of odd. I don't know who this God is because I thought I was reading about a different God up to this point. Well, then we can start at the very beginning and go back to Genesis 1. And Colin is gracious to be with us this morning and is going to offer some teaching and reflection on the creation of humankind. Um, but what I'm trying to show is from the end, moving back to the beginning, that there is this, this common thread through all of Scripture that is about God's redemptive purposes, God's loving purposes for every single human being. And the way it works itself out, because things get so messed up, is through the one to the universal, the one to the many. And we're going to talk about that whole concept in subsequent weeks. So again, just a quick summary of the goals for this course, and then I'm going to hand the baton off to Colin. Uh, one is to just help us read the Bible, um, more familiarity, and that's a lifelong project. Uh, number two, as I've been saying, is uh, an interpretive key that might help unlock deeper understanding, especially around maybe more difficult passages or passages we're less familiar with is to understand this consistent theme of um, being called into God's mission. We've been recruited by God to be on the team that will work to bring the whole world uh, back into right relationship with him. So thirdly, and that really touches on it, is to understand that we're actors in the story. I've, I've titled the course, um, you know, Finding Our Place in the Bible's Story of God's Mission. So we are still living out this drama, this, this narrative. We, we are called to have an active part in what, again, is there from the beginning as it stretches forward uh, to the end. So speaking of the beginning, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Thank you in advance. And you can just press that to get to your text. Well, thank you, Lee, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of, part of this class, and I'm excited to be able to talk just for a few minutes 
about a really amazing passage that we are all probably very familiar with uh, from Genesis 1. It's the story of the creation of humankind, where we are told that we are created in God's image and in his likeness. Uh, there's three times in the Old Testament where we meet this idea that we're created in God's image. Uh, all of them occur in Genesis, uh, Genesis 1, Genesis 5, and Genesis 9. But Genesis 1 gives the most uh, description about what this might mean for us. So that's why we're going to focus on this today. Uh, I'll read the passage in, in just a second, uh, but to give a little context to remind us where uh, this falls, this passage falls in the scriptures. Uh, this is right there at the beginning. Uh, in Genesis from 1, Genesis 1-1 one, one, to Genesis 2-4, we have the first creation narrative. It's a poetic narrative about the creation of the heavens and the earth. And this is the one, the story where God creates in six days and he rests on the seventh. And we as humans were told are created on the sixth day. Now, a lot of things happen on the sixth day. We might be disappointed that we don't get our own day uh, in the week, uh, but we're told that God creates all uh, the animals who live on the dry land that day. Uh, but then the second half of that day, we are as humans given special emphasis and our creation is described. And this is what we read. And if you have a Bible at home, you might wanna grab it because I'm gonna be walking through the text for just the next few minutes. Genesis one uh, chat, uh, verses 26 through 27. But we read this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So let me walk through this and just point out some ideas that I think are important for us and I, th and I think have relevance to the larger conversation uh, that Lee is engaging us with. First thing we see is we are told in the beginning that God says, let us make, let us, plural. Now in the creation story, this is new. With everything other that God has created, God has just spoken. It's been a monologue. But all of a sudden here, we get a dialogue, which kind of um, is an intentional way to show us that something different is happening here. This is, this is important. Uh, when God says, let us make humankind, let us, we don't really know who the us refers to. This could be an inner dialogue within the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's how I was always taught to read this, and I tend to read it that way. But there's other scholars who say that this might be referring to some divine council or heavenly court. But again, there is dialogue. And what we see is God is inviting others into the act of creation. And I think this is a kind of a profound little thing to note that God invites others into the act of creation. Again, whether it's, uh, this is inside the life of God or within some heavenly court, God is in effect sharing his power as he creates. So remember that idea, God sharing his power as he creates, because that has relevance for us. God, when he creates, he shares power. All right, so that's the let us, and we'll keep going. Let us make humankind in our own image according to our likeness. We are made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean uh, to image something? Well, to image something means, number one, reflection, and number two, representation. If I took a canvas, 
and painted a picture of you on it. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create an accurate reflection of you so that uh, if anyone were to come and to look at this painting uh, for centuries, who would like to know what you look like, well, they could go to it. They could look at the painting, and the painting would represent you to them. And what God is saying here is something like that. He's saying, I have created you as humans to reflect my glory, to reflect my goodness, my, my love, my character. I have made you like a canvas or like a mirror and you are capable of reflecting my character. So we are told here that uh, we have as humans this created potential within our human nature to reflect and image God. That, that's part of who we are within our nature. Um, this idea that a human can represent God, it actually would have been a familiar idea in the ancient Near East. Uh, in the ancient Near East, the king was often seen as an image, uh, as a designated representative of the gods ruling on their behalf. But what is striking, and what we see in Genesis 1, is what, what this passage done is it democratizes this image. So that now, all of humanity has again this created potential to represent and reflect God. It's not just one person appointed to do this. Instead, all of us can do this. Um, and as a side note, I mean, this becomes really interesting as we think about the incarnation uh, in Jesus and who he is and how he is the icon and the image of God through our human nature. Um, Two quick points um, to make about this idea of image of God. Uh, the first point is there's been a lot of speculation about what it actually means we're created in the image of God. Um, for most of the history of the Christian church, the thought has, met, has been that this refers to our ability to reason, to reason creatively. Um, some people speculate it's our ability to transcend ourselves. Others specu speculate it's our ability to love in a certain way within a community, like uh, the love within the community of the Trinity. Um, those are all probably true to some degree, but we actually aren't told in the text exactly what it means that we're made in the image, just that we are. Second thing um, to point out is in verse 27 regarding the image of God. Uh, it talks about male and female. It says, so God created humankind in his image in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. And so if you read biblical commentators, they make a lot about this point. You know, when God created the animals, he obviously made them male and female, but he doesn't talk about that. It just says he created animals. But for us, there's this intentionality. We're created in God's image, male and female. Uh, so the fact that both male and female represent God, it's not just one over the other. And the idea uh, that God is not to be understood as just male or female. God transcends uh, and is actually representative, represented in our similarities and our differences as males and females. Now, last kind of point to make about this, and one word I want to talk about this, is the idea of dominion. So we continue reading our text. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. And then he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild things and over the creeping things that creep on the earth. We are given dominion. Right? Really important, especially as we think about mission. And this idea of being given dominion is reinforced in the next verse. We don't have it up here. But God says this in the next verse. He says to the first man and first woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And then he lists all the things for us to have dominion over. Again, dominion. And again, it's, re it's repeated. Uh, so the author really doesn't want us to miss this fact. So a few things about this idea of dominion. Um, first thing 
and I think this is a, another striking point, the first divine words that describe us in Scripture and the first words spoken to us in Scripture are not about our relationship with God. God doesn't create us and say, this is what I want our relationship to look like. Instead, the first words, again, about us and spoken to us, are about our relationship to creation, to earth. And they constitute a sharing of power. Remember that idea we talked about earlier, a sharing of power. Dominion means a control or sovereignty or power. And the first words that God says to us is he says, I'm going to share my power with you. I'm giving you power. Now that, that's amazing, right? Instead of me being the only one with power, I'm going to share it with you. From the beginning, God chooses not to be the only one who exercises creative power. I mean, the initiative for creation, it's been all God's. But then he invites us into this power-sharing relationship with us, with him. Again, a profound idea. And I think if we take that seriously, we should be in awe. Uh, just like the psalmist is in awe as he thinks about this. Psalm 8, the great psalm. But listen to how the psalmist reflects about our creation and the sharing of power with us. He says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh, oh, oh Lord, our sovereign how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have given them dominion, is what he says. We're in this power-sharing relationship with God. And this word dominion, uh, it's important to know, if you look at the, the Hebrew dictionaries on this, um, it makes the point that this word is to be understood as caregiving. There's even this idea of nurturing, um, it's, it's not about taking what we want from God's creation, but it's about caring for it. Um, even this word subdue, he tells us to subdue. When we hear the word subdue, we think about armies marching in, taking over a city or a population. But this is really talking about the earth itself, uh, cultivating the land and helping the land reach its fullest created potential. So that's what our power is given to us for to help creation become the creation God desires it to be, which is actually what we see in Revelation later on. Now, one quick note, and I'll pass it back to Lee. Um, this idea about us being created in God's image and being created in relationship with him, that does mean the source of our identity lies outside of ourselves. That's really important to know as we live out our lives. We are made in the image of God, and so our identity is found in Him and in representing Him. In other words, we are not self-sufficient at the level of identity, which probably explains a lot of human behavior as we seek to find our identity in our work and our relationships and our experiences. But because we're made in His image and find our identity in Him, uh, the words of Augustine ring true that we are restless until we rest in Him. So just a few comments and notes on Genesis uh, 1 and the understanding of us being created in the image of God. And with that, I'll hand it back to Lee. Thank you, Colin. Such a good teacher. There's a lot in a relatively brief um, um, time there uh, about this text, which uh, needless to say is central, central to uh, understanding why we are, who we are, what we're to do, and as I'm making the point, the rest of, of the whole narrative. Um, so I 
want to suggest that from these verses, we learn that we were created for relationship with God, that um, um, that actually, I think Colin made a really good point. God doesn't create us and then say, this is what I want a relationship to be like. If you're um, somebody who's just met uh, a person that you would like to date or to court and you start out with that, that's probably not going to be a winning line. Um, this becomes obviously central when the relationship is severed, as it will be in the next couple of pages of the Bible. But we're also made for responsibility with God. I liked uh, your word reflecting God's character. God has made us regents, uh, ambassadors. Um, that's why we are special and set apart among all the created um, uh, animals of the earth. So, uh, Colin did point this verse out. The next one is, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion. It's also in the next creation account in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. So we're to be cultivators, culture makers. We are to bless culture. That's where the word culture comes from, the idea of farming, of tilling the ground and keeping it. So Genesis 1 has a creation account. Genesis 2 has a creation account. In both of them, God gives humanity responsibility um, to, to tend to things, to tend and to bless creation and to be a blessing within creation. Just in a few minutes before we wrap this up, if I were to ask you, you know, what is mission? I asked you earlier, what is, what is, what is the end game? What, what is the chief end of man? What is mission? Our own Book of Common Prayer has a catechism um, issued in a question and answer format. So what is the mission of the church? I think this is a, a solid definition. The mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. What I would like to point out, if I were to add something to that, is the mission of the church is God's mission before it's our mission. Okay, you've heard me say this before, but I ask you to, to remember it, learn it, if not memorize it. It's not that the church has a mission, it's that the mission has a church. Okay, I didn't make that up, by the way, but it's very handy. So we are church because we've been incorporated into God's mission. It's not like we're the church and, well, what's our mission? And churches ask that question all the time. What they really mean is, what does God want to do through us in this place at this time with these people and with our resources? That's the way you ask the question. Well, what's our mission? It's not that the church has a mission. It's that the mission has a church. Um, one uh, very succinct definition of the church tries to get at this. Uh, David Bosch, one of the 20th century's great missiologists, that's a theologian of mission, South African, Put it this way, I actually think he was being provocative when he wrote this. The definition of church, a body of people sent on a mission. I would say there are other things to say about the church. His point is you will never be church if you don't understand this about yourself, however. So if you can say a lot of different things about being church, but if you don't understand that you're a body of people sent on a mission, you're not really the church. Um, again, a provocative statement that comes from a very, very thick book that he wrote on the subject, but I've always, always loved that. I think next week uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some modern discomforts that we all have when we talk about mission and evangelism, and they're, they're born of, of stereotypes, but stereotypes come into being because there's some truth in them, and we need to just face the facts. Um, you know, what, what does mission look like today for us uh, that maybe looks different from what it has in other epochs in history? Um, as incarnational people, we can embody Jesus in, in every conceivable cultural way and context. Um, but we do need to ask questions about why, why are we uncomfortable with the, the conversation around evangelism or mission in our day beyond the stereotypes? Um, three quick reasons for this, and this has been written about and studied by folks who are a lot smarter than I am. Um, one reason is because for those of us who've grown up in sort of Western Christianity, 
um, North America, especially perhaps in the South, it doesn't occur to us that people around us are not Christian. So the question is not really confronting us. I grew up in a small town in Virginia, um, and uh, I just, everybody I knew went to church that, you know, it was like, they went, they're Catholic, you know, that was something. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I was a child, so I didn't have the full perspective that I would today about that. But today, I mean, you know, look at the, the surveys. I mean, you know, we're, we're a minority in terms of active, committed Christians. Um, so it's confronting us again. Wow, what, what is it to represent Jesus, to represent God, to reflect God's image in a world like this where people don't either know God or just don't even care? It's not a question they're all that interested in. Number two, a good reason um, that we had a loss of missional consciousness in the West over the last few hundred years has to do with the Enlightenment. We're not going to get into all that right now. But this notion that, that our faith commitments are private and not something that are really public commitments. So we have this, this split between our private faith and our public life, our work life, our social relationships. Um, and there are reasons for that, of course. Uh, things like the Hundred Years' War <laughs> in Europe uh, made people say, get religion out of public life. It's a disaster. Uh, so the pendulum swung too far the other way. Uh, if it's just merely something private that we cherish and not something that we share. And then lastly, a good reason why we've lost missional consciousness, I think, in the West is we've kind of farmed it out to the professionals. A missionary is, is somebody who does that full time and goes overseas, or it's our outreach funding. You know, we've got various silos of ministry here at St. George's, and the budget's carved up like that. And, oh, yeah, we do mission. Mission is here. That's this, this is mission. If you're interested, we'd love to have you volunteer. Um, so rather than seeing mission, again, as of the very essence of the church and all that we do. I want to end with a quick story and then a quotation. Um, I was out in, um, I was at a, on a continuing education week last summer, and I ran into um, a gentleman named Steve Garber, uh, who was telling me about work he's done on this subject of trying to reconnect our calling as missionaries to ordinary Christians in today's world. And he's been here in Nashville a number of times and done conferences. But he was talking about mission at a conference. And afterward, a man came up to him who confessed to the following. And I'm going to read the quote, but, but the confession is simply this. This man, all his life as a Christian, felt that he really wasn't living up to his calling because he had like a, a, a normal job. And he went to this conference and was hearing no, 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 we're, we're all called to be um, regents, ambassadors for Christ, uh, missionaries into every realm of life, personal, social, political, professional, you name it. And this was the revelation that the gentleman shared. I am 50 years old and have been in the church my whole life. My work has been at the intersection of business and technology. But over the years, I have come to the conclusion that the work I do is second-class work. It's not spiritual. That if I had been more serious, that is to say more serious about his faith, more visionary, I would have done something that God would have been honored by, something more religious than what I have done my whole life. But I want to tell you that over the weekend, the weekend of the conference, a wound in my heart has been healed. What this gentleman is describing is understanding that God has placed him right where God wants him, and that's where he is to represent God's purposes, God's grace, and God's love for the, for the sake of the nations. That is to say, for the sake of everyone around him, everyone around you and me. So as I've said, these are unstable, unsettling times. This is the time for us to return to fundamentals, to return to our vision, and our vision is born, is anchored in just the, the very beginnings and the end of Scripture. It's woven all the way through. Mission is an interpretive key that will open up every single passage of Scripture once you really get this, and I, and I know you do. So to end with um, one of the well-known proverbs, um, where there is no vision, the people perish. 
actually a more literal translation of that is not nearly as poetical as that, <laughs> which is why we have this vision, uh, tradition. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there is not prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint, is a literal Hebrew translation. And the Hebrew word, cast off restraint, listen to this, the word is meant to conjure the image of a woman with long hair blowing in the wind. It's not tied up. So it's just like, Isn't that interesting. That's what that, that means there. So um, I don't know whether I'm having a fainting spell or that's gotten dimmer. <laughs> But uh, I got to wrap this up. Um, we're losing power here. Um, Octavia Butler is a Christian author from the 20th century. I don't know if anybody's read some of her works. Um, and uh, this is from her novel, The Parable of the Talents. When vision fails, direction is lost. When direction is lost, purpose may be forgotten. When purpose is forgotten, Emotion rules alone. When emotion rules alone, destruction, destruction. You could apply that to all kinds of contexts today. But what I want us to hear is we, we will fall apart as the church if we lose our vision. That's the thread in her poem from beginning to end. Um, and so this is, a, this is a time for us to recapture our vision, uh, that we were, we were created to be in, in relationship with God, and God is overjoyed, overjoyed that we've accepted that in Christ. But we were also created to be his ambassadors, to be his witnesses, not just to one another, but as Jesus tells his disciples, to the ends of the earth. So we'll pick that up next week, and I hope you'll come back. But thanks for being here today. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably should have said people come send us your questions.